from our State House studio in Montgomery. I'm Todd Stacy. Welcome to Capitol Journal. The Alabama Legislature returns Tuesday for what promises to be a busy and contentious week of session. The House and Senate are moving at a fast pace with another three legislative day week expected. That would put lawmakers at six completed legislative days by Thursday and technically 20% finished with the 2024 session. One issue we expect to see on the Senate floor this week is absentee voting. Republicans have made it a priority this year to crack down on what they call ballot harvesting or paid efforts to collect and submit absentee ballots in mass. Lieutenant Governor Will Ainsworth said he expects that and other contentious issues to be front and center this week. I do think the Senate is going to take up some controversial things in the first two weeks. And uh, I think there's some stuff, I mean, you know, look, ballot harvesting, you know, we don't need people, you know, going out, um, you know, harvesting ballots from people. I mean, that's not, you know, I mean, if you want to vote, you should go vote yourself, right? And uh, we don't need people going out collecting hundreds of ballots and taking them in. I mean, that's not how the process should work. So, you know, I support that legislation. Um, I don't think it should be controversial because, you know, but I'm sure it will be. Um, but I think, you know, uh, certainly my understanding is first few weeks in the Senate, you know, there could yep. be some fireworks. Democrats have been fiercely opposed to Republicans on this issue, arguing that such a law could make it harder for elderly and rural voters to cast ballots. A long debate full of filibusters has generally been expected, but Senate Minority Leader Bobby Singleton said he's been in talks with the bill's sponsor about compromises that could lead to Democrats easing off their opposition. And those things that has the penalties on it, where you can't pay someone for their ballot, that's illegal anyway. We're fine with that. We don't want to see that anyway, so we're okay with that. While I may think that the penalties are a little stiff, but at the end of the day, if that's the compromise that we have to make, then that's the compromise we have to make. But still, the free access to the ballot is still there, and people still have that right to give the assistance where assistance may be needed. Another issue set to come up tomorrow is gambling. House Bills 151 and 152 are scheduled for a public hearing in the House Economic Development and Tourism Committee meeting. Here's another quick overview of what we know about the gambling bills. The plan would scrap all of, all of Alabama's existing gambling laws and constitutional amendments, including those local bingo amendments. Then the plan would institute a state lottery, expand casino gambling, and legalize sports betting. It would set up a commission with a staff structure to regulate the industry with commissioners appointed by the governor and legislative leaders. 11 total casinos would be allowed under the plan, including the current three, uh, the Porch Band of Creek Indian sites. Operators could bid for licenses in Macon, Green, Mobile, Jefferson, Houston, and Lowndes counties, where of course there are existing gambling operations. There would also be an additional license awarded pending approval of a compact with the Porch Creeks. Casinos would be taxed at 24%, while sports betting would be taxed at 17%. Proponents estimate revenue to the state would be between $800 million and $1 billion annually. Where would that money go? Lottery proceeds would all go toward a special fund set aside for education needs. Casino and sports betting revenue would be placed in a trust fund to shore up general fund accounts and then used for expenditures like health care and mental health care. One key voting block in the gambling debate is Democrats. While Republicans have a supermajority in both the House and Senate, there tends to be enough opposition to gambling from Republicans to need at least some Democratic support to get that two-thirds majority needed to pass a constitutional amendment. In fact, that was the scenario back in 2021. Democrats this year say they will not allow their votes to be taken for granted in the process and are watching closely to see exactly how those, including those constitutional amendments would work. Well, whenever we make any decision as a group, as a caucus, every member within our caucus has influence on that decision. And we're not gonna make uh, any choices of choosing winners and losers. And so whatever comes out will be vetted and supported by the members within our caucus. Uh, and, and, you know, we know that it, we're not going to get everything that we need. But we have to understand the economic impact in these communities and how 
uh, the process and the way we've dealt with this process in the past have had an indirectly negative impact on these particular communities, growth. You know, we can't talk about, uh, you know, choosing this group over that group. When these communities have had these operations in place for some time, and we're going to, who, who, who are we to make a choice to decide which, which one stayed and which one go? And let the market dictate that, but we're going to be with our colleagues on this. Governor Kay Ivey today announced another milestone for the state's economy. Data from 2023 shows that Alabama shattered its previous record on exports, reaching an impressive $27.4 billion in goods and services exported. This represents a substantial 6% increase from the previous year. And since the COVID-19 pandemic, Alabama's exports have surged by nearly 43%. The governor's office attributes much of this growth to a significant rise in overseas shipments of Alabama-made vehicles, aerospace parts, minerals, and metals. Alabama's exports are now reaching 190 countries worldwide. Our biggest trading partners are Germany with $5.1 billion, Canada with $3.9 billion, China with $3.8 billion, and Mexico with $3.2 billion, and finally, South Korea with $1.2 billion, which is up 15% from the previous year, which is a notable increase. Today in the State House, a meeting about the past, present, and future of the grocery sales tax. Lawmakers last year enacted a plan to reduce state sales tax on most grocery items from 4% to 3%. The law also said that that tax could drop further to 2% if revenue growth in the Education Trust Fund grew by 3.5%. But recent budget estimates show that's not the case, making that further reduction impossible this year. Today, the Joint Study Commission on Grocery Taxation met to delve deeper into the numbers behind that decision. But you still have the opportunity because the language didn't go, didn't say that that provision went away at the end of this year. It says that you can do it again when we certify estimates next year, and if at that point in time the average estimates are about 3.5%, you can lower the rate by the extra 1%. I think we'll know more as we enter into the fall. Um, certainly the fact that growth was so much smaller than anticipated this year, uh, around 2% or a little bit less than 2%, there's a possibility in my mind that if we had a lower than average year, that maybe next year we'll be at average or above. We need to look at those different entities that are being pulled from the ATO. I mean, we talk about the $100,000, $100 million being for the choice school choice to affect 12,000 students. And so we also have to look at that as compared to people that's living every day and need food to eat and need relief. We're still seeing inflation and food costs. So those are things that I think will be discussed at length throughout the session. Coming up after the break, I'll sit down with those authors of the grocery sales tax cut to talk about what might be happening next on that issue. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. Keep up with what's happening with Capital Journal. Fred Shuttlesworth was one of the pioneering figures of the civil rights era and the central leader of the movement in Birmingham. As pastor of Bethel Baptist Church and founder of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights, Shuttlesworth spearheaded civil rights actions in Birmingham throughout the 1950s and 60s. In 1957, Shuttlesworth helped found the Southern Christian Leadership Council with Martin Luther King Jr. and Ralph Abernathy. In 1963, he convinced King to join his efforts to desegregate businesses in Birmingham, helping to spearhead the series of protests that became known as the Birmingham Campaign. 
press coverage and public outcry over the brutal treatment of protesters pressured President John F. Kennedy to introduce into Congress legislation that would eventually become the 1964 Civil Rights Act. In 2008, the Birmingham Airport was renamed the Birmingham Shuttlesworth International Airport in his honor. Welcome back to Capital Journal. As we've just learned, there was a big meeting today in the State House about the, the past and future of the state's sales tax on groceries. Joining me next to talk about it are the joint authors or co-sponsors of the bill removing that one cent sales tax, State Representative Penny McClammy from here in Montgomery, and State Senator Andrew Jones from Gadsden. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for the invitation. Good to be with you. So this meeting today, um, I mean, it was well-timed because you know, at the beginning of this session, we're learning that 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 second one penny reduction on the state sales tax on groceries isn't going to happen this year. So, so you know, not surprisingly, you all have a lot of questions. Your commission members have a lot of questions. But before we get to kind of the, the crux of the meeting, walk me through and remind our viewers how we got to this point. You all passed a law, lots of discussion. Um, and, and what did that law do? I'll start with you. Well, first of all, the people spoke. I always have to say this was really a people's bill. You know, they spoke overwhelmingly throughout the state of Alabama, bipartisan, that they needed some relief off of their groceries, and that was starting with taking a percentage off the sales tax. You know, we were one of three states that did not have any tax relief from groceries tax. And so we were finally moving up in progress with the rest of the United States mm -hmm. and giving the people some relief. And I applauded our legislators because it was unanimous in both houses that that sales tax was needed and that we would start this repeal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, one of those bipartisan issues that, you know, saw a couple last year, a handful last year that yes. were really interesting. And this was right at the top of that list. Well, Senator, there's a reason why it was bipartisan, because it kind of took some maneuvering, right, especially from kind of the budget hawks that really want to protect that education revenue, knowing that sales tax goes to education. So that was kind of a complicated formula for how it would move forward. Can you explain that a little bit? Sure. Well, the, the state sales tax on groceries is 4%. That's the state portion. doesn't include the city or county portions. So that 4%, we decided we could afford to take off one cent initially, and then we looked at the average growth of the ETF, the Education Trust Fund, over time. We found that in an average year, the growth was about 3.5%. So we decided that the metric for the next cent to come off, the next 1% to come off with the grocery tax would be if we hit 3.5% growth or higher. So this year we fell somewhere, uh, the average of the two estimates that were required for that uh, or a little bit less than 2%, we believe. So we're, we're short of the mark this year, but we're confident that we will eventually hit that, maybe even next year, and have the additional 1% come off of the grocery tax. Mm -hmm. Well, it looked like some folks in that room were pretty disappointed that this was not going to be that second penny this year. Talk about that. What, is there disappointment, or are you looking towards more optimism towards next year? I I think you hit it correctly. Uh, I don't know about you all, but I did feel disappointed um, personally, and some of the constituents that I am, um, that I have, they were disappointed, and so that was the reason for us to call this meeting today, so that we could, you know, we've been through the presentations, but we wanted the community to know and our task force members to know what was being projected, and not just be told through hearsay, but actually be able to discuss it as a committee, and. We are disappointed, but also there were other means that came out, other questions that came out today, questioning are there ways that we still possibly could, you know, consider relieving another cent off the tax. So. Mm -hmm. Well, it kind of comes down to this classic question of, of taxes, right? Yes. I mean, any time you cut a tax, there's a repercussion, repercussion in the budget. This is a perfect example. But it sounded also like from what Mr. Fulford was saying, that the, the hit, so to speak, to the Education Trust Fund was not nearly what many people feared. So talk about that if it wasn't that great of a hit, um, and yet we still didn't hit that mark. Well, I think in a lot of ways, Todd, we've been a victim of our own success. Mm -hmm. We've untaxed overtime pay. That was a great bipartisan piece of legislation as well. We have looked at other tax credits and tax cuts, and so all of that 
goes into the formula that determines the growth of the education budget. So because we've been cutting taxes, our growth is not high enough for us to cut taxes even further. <laughs> it's kind of ironic in a way. But, um, you know, I, I will mention that despite the fact that you hear, you know, one penny and another penny, this combined is the largest tax cut in Alabama history, $304 million, and that's a lot of relief. You know, we're talking about over uh, a week's groceries for many folks, two weeks by some estimates. So we're talking about three to $350 per household per year. So it does have a big impact, and uh, we're looking to see how folks are using that money. And we suspect that a lot of those funds are being utilized for additional you know, purchases, goods and services, and thus some of that money is going to be coming back into the education trust fund because people spend that. It gets tax on, you know, if you buy a TV, you're paying sales tax and that comes back to the education trust fund. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And I, I remember Representative Daniels making that point about his overtime. income, yeah, the, the overtime income tax cut, like, hey, this is going to help. So I, I will be curious to see those numbers coming in because we are at the beginning, you know, of, of some of these laws going into effect. You know, one of the, you talked about the impact on folks' budgets and their families having more to, more in their pocket. What have y'all heard feedback-wise from your constituents? Maybe you've heard your colleagues talk about their constituents. When, when they see that impact on the grocery receipt, uh, what, has there been a tangible feedback so far? It has been on my side, I know. And, you know, as I said, I think the biggest time that people realized that we were really having a tax, a cent off a tax, of our grocery tax was the first day. You yeah. know, there was a little small hiccup with one of the stores. Walmart, right? Yes, it was, but you know, Walmart was quick to get on board, make those changes, and also make sure that they compensate the customers for their time. And so they held that very well. And that was the only one about all the grocers across the state. And so with that, if you didn't know that there was a penny off that day. I think the whole state of Alabama realized it that day. That's that's right, because we were joking earlier, like that was a bigger news story. That, that, because it's Walmart, because right. it's a, you know, a problem, a snafu, maybe a bigger news story than, than the bill passing to begin with. So it almost helped you know, advertise the, the legislation. Oh yes, they did have people going back with their receipts, getting About their that. refunds, and also additional um, gift cards that the store gave away to make things right with the customers. Have you heard feedback yourself? I have heard a lot of feedback. Uh, you know, everyone knows that situation in the grocery store where you see someone have to put something back. You know, they're at the checkout line because they can't afford uh, something that's in their cart mm -hmm. or that it's over their budget. I've heard, you know, those situations, uh, you know, those folks have had more money to utilize and so they're they're pleased that their dollar goes a little bit further even though inflation is is taking up even more of their money when they go to the checkout line so we're combating inflation you know that's part of it too one reason that folks may not feel it as much i've also heard from constituents that say hey you know we want more right. uh, and i'm like hold on that's that's coming but probably the biggest question i get is folks uh, just saying hey you know is is this or that covered you know, they don't, they're not still clear on what items are covered and what are not. That's a good you know, point. Your, your hot deli foods, for example, are not included in the SNAP def definition of food. Um, and then other folks wondering whether their, their alcohol or tobacco are going to be tax free. And I tell them, no, you know, it's just your groceries. <laughs> so um, there's still some education to be done. Yeah. Oh, you, you talk about the hit to the ETF then, uh, if, if something like that was a part of it. Well, it begs the question, today's meeting begs the question, because there's not another penny coming off this year, it begs the question, is this law going to be tweaked and changed? Is there going to be an appetite to do that? You heard some talk about maybe lowering that threshold mm -hmm. of growth needed um, to trigger the, the, the next penny coming off. Talk about, I mean, look, I know it's pretty early in the it's session. Early, but, but, but it's still something worth discussing like we did today. You know, initially that was an amendment that was added right before we voted for that threshold of 3.5 percent off a of net. And so these are questions that we're going to continue to watch, continue to ask questions about, and see if there's something that we need to amend the legislation if needed. Mm -hmm. um, Senator, would there be an appetite upstairs in your caucus for doing something like that? I mean, that's a pretty significant change. I think we need to wait and see. I think we'll know more. You just, we, have, we just have a few months of data right now because this mm -hmm. started uh, oh. September. So we'll know more as time goes on. Uh, maybe instead of uh, you know, adjusting the percentage, maybe we need to talk about net versus gross receipts. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that was a big 
impact in some of this. So we'll see. Uh, you know, my hope is that the fact that we've had a lower than average growth pattern this year means that next year we'll be due for an average or above average growth pattern, in which case the, the, the point about change will be mute, uh, moot because we'll be there and we'll have the required percentage for us to take down the extra percent. That's a great point because, I mean, the year this happened last year was probably the high water mark in terms of sales tax into the state, in terms of budgets in, in general into the state. So it's kind of hard to expect a, a lot of growth at that point, you know, after you're, you know you're at this, you know, the, t the tide is high. Um, so talk about that. You know, you're talking about victim of our own success. Um, are you all going to be talking to, you know, experts in the in LSA, to your fellow colleagues about what is the right number? Because it seems to me that when people voted for this bill, they did want to step it down, they, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess there is some caution when it comes to budgets. Well, our, our budget chairman, are, they're, they're supposed to be very conservative by nature and protect the budgets. Uh, and so obviously we'll talk with them. Uh, we'll talk with Lieutenant Governor Ainsworth, who is a big champion of this legislation, uh, because he uh, certainly will have some ideas and thoughts that he'll he'll want to contribute to the, to the discussion as we move forward. But um, I think certainly we'll know more. We'll look at the data and see what that reflects, and then uh, make a decision from there on what we need to do. Sure. And I know for myself and others, um, we would like to look at what's all coming from the Education Trust Fund. You know, we look at the possibility of this bill of school choice. And so we look at a hundred hundred million dollars coming out from roughly 12,000 students. Um, and that also can affect our not meeting that threshold. Mm -hmm. So those are things that we want to look and in, look into Education Trust Fund and see what's coming in and out of the Education Trust Fund. So it all comes out in the wash. Like you were saying, every time you cut a tax, it kind of gets into that growth and so you're in a you're kind of in a different situation even when you were this time last year when you were first kind of getting this bill going yes um, let me speak on the on the revenue side if you go back 10 you know 15 20 years on this every time this was proposed there was also revenue enhancements on the other side essentially getting back revenue a lot of times it was closing the federal uh, ending the federal deduction on right. state taxes and we looked at that this time Right, so talk about that. Is that even part of the discussion, looking at this going forward, those that federal deduction or anything like it? Well, I think that's something that the task force committee, that's why we're set up to look at those alternatives. Those alternatives, like, as you know, this didn't just happen last year when we decided to cut yeah. tax on groceries. This has been a discussion for at least two decades, right. you know, starting with Representative John Knight. And so- But also your father. And my father, thank you, thank you, my father, Pat McClammy. And so, this is decades of work, and, and so there will be. That's why we um, did this joint resolution for the meeting, the committee, so that we can find, follow those financials and discuss what other areas we have that we can pull to ensure that we can continue to reduce the grocery tax. And just as we were created for as this task force to do so, I think we're going to continue to take that data, continue to meet as we need to and see what's the best way to continue to make sure that the citizens get what they want. Mm -hmm. Senator, what about from your side of the aisle? I mean, you talk about revenue, revenue enhancement. Sometimes that sounds like taxes might make folks nervous. Well, just from discussions I've had with colleagues upstairs in the Senate, you know, I, I think there's some difficulty to understand why we would need a revenue increase when our budgets have been so healthy and, and looking so good. Now, certainly we know lean times are probably ahead and uh, more, um, flat growth rather than the you know gangbusters type growth that we've had in recent years but uh, my personal thought is that we can absorb these cuts in a sustainable manner over time which is what the whole thrust of the bill was to start with yeah. so as we're moving forward and we look at this and we, we assess the growth then I think it's going to naturally work itself out over time of course we might need to revisit and talk about some of the definitions in the bill and some of the mm -hmm. metrics and, and have an assessment of those but I think a sustainable tax cut is what we were after uh, from the get-go so that we protect education Most definitely. W while uh, helping working families. But it's safe to say after today's meeting and, and after all the work you all have done, the goal of getting all that 4% off is still alive and well, uh, just a little, little more complicated. Most definitely. We didn't come in this fight to give up. Mm -hmm.
it's a top priority, uh, I think it's fair to say, for both of us. Yes. Well, well, thank you for your work on it. I know it's, it, like I said, complicated legislation, but it's good to see bipartisan teamwork uh, on, a, on a big ticket item like this. So thanks again for your time tonight, you. and uh, we'll see you as the session goes forward. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. It. Great to be with you. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. The World War II era Tuskegee Airmen were the first African-American pilots in U.S. military service. Because Tuskegee was the only training facility for black pilots in the United States during World War II, potential pilots came from all over the country. The first African-American flying unit was the 99th Fighter Squadron, which deployed in the spring of 1943. The 99th earned a distinguished unit citation flying missions against enemy targets over Italy. The second flying unit, the 332nd Fighter Group, flew several successful bomber escort missions throughout the war. Its P-51 fighters had distinctively painted red tails, earning the unit and its planes the nickname Red Tails. In 1948, President Truman issued an executive order mandating the racial integration of all military services. The way was paved by the Tuskegee Airmen of World War II, and in 2007, President Bush collectively awarded them a Congressional Gold Medal. That's our show for tonight. Thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow night at the same time with more coverage of the Alabama Legislature right here on Alabama Public Television. For our Capitol Journal team, and especially Rod Richardson, whose birthday is today. I'm Todd Stacy. We'll see you next time.